what might be called a survey of a long period of time. I'm going to um, spice it up with a little bit of my own personal experiences. I might call on Jerry Schwell to throw in a couple of his experiences. Um, but I'm I going will. to, I think, talk to you today about things that you might not have thought about. So we're going to talk about the wars, but we're going to talk about other things as well. And um, we're going to talk about strategies. So to start with, I want you to imagine Theodore Herzl and the dream that he had that we discussed in our very first session. And I want you to understand a principle that I'm going to assert now and probably try and assert at the end of the talk. And that is that Israel could have not accomplished anything without the assistance of a major power in the world. Okay? Foundation. Israel on its own could not have accomplished anything without the assistance of a major power in the world. So I will recall to you that Herzl went and negotiated with the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. So his first effort was to negotiate with the Ottoman Empire to get the Ottoman Empire to allow the Jews to resettle Palestine. Now, he offered something that Herzl and others offered him. He offered money, but he was also, I believe, relying on something else. And that something else, which I want you to keep in mind when you think, oh, Muslims are bad, was that when the Inquisition took place in Spain and in Portugal, and then in Italy, the country that accepted the Jews was Turkey. The Jews of Turkey were refugees from the Inquisition. And the Sultan and the Ottoman Empire welcomed the Jews into Turkey. And in fact, there were very wealthy Turkish individuals and in fact the Turkish woman who helped other poor Jews settle in Turkey. The negotiations shifted after World War I from Turkey to Britain. Britain seized Palestine from the Ottomans during World War I. And in 1917, the Zionists succeeded in getting the Balfour Declaration. So they lined up another major world power. Unfortunately, it wasn't as major as it needed to be, but a major world power to get behind the settlement of the Jews in Palestine as a national entity. And their um, declaration included the words, nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities. That was the Balfour Declaration. To this day, the Palestinians feel that was the beginning of the end for them. And in many ways, it was. In 1920, the San Remo um, conference gave Palestine to Britain as a mandate, a complete mandate official, and the Middle East was di divided up. Lines were drawn, countries were created, and Britain got the mandate for Palestine. France, Lebanon, Syria. 
the United States was actually asked to take over what would have been Kurdistan, or what is Kurdistan. The United States declined that. But post-World War I, lines were drawn on a map, and countries were created, regardless of ethnicities, regardless of anything. In 1922, Britain says the Transjordan, what we now call today Jordan, is not going to be part of Mandate Palestine and actually forbade Jews to settle on the other side of the Jordan River. There was a song from uh, Beitar, from the Revisionist Youth Movement, that went, There are two sides to the Jordan River. This side is ours, talking about where we settled in Palestine. And that side is ours too. So Jabotinsky and the Revisionists believed in the original Balfour Declaration, which did not eliminate Jews from settling in Transjordan. Then there was a period of horrible riots. I talked about them a little bit last week, but the riots essentially convinced the British of two things. One, they wanted to get rid of the mandate. They didn't want it anymore. And two, they passed a restriction on Jewish immigration to Palestine. And unfortunately, they did this in 1939, just before the war. The gates to America were closed and the gates to Palestine were closed. The war breaks out and Ben-Gurion and Rabin and Yigal alone and others have an argument. It was a very interesting argument. Ben-Gurion wanted the Jews to fight with the British in World War II. And there was a Jewish battalion created under the British army. Wingate, after whom there's an uh, academy named in Israel, a physical fitness academy. Lord Wingate commanded that battalion. But people in the Haganah said, no, don't send the people to fight in Europe. Keep them here so we're ready to fight here when we finally declare our independence. But Ben-Gurion wanted them to fight. They did fight in World War II. They did come back to Palestine. They did it reintegrate into the Haganah, and many of them became officers. But the precariousness of the situation has to be understood in this way. Even though um, we wonder to this day why the Allies did not bomb the concentration camps or the rail lines leading to the concentration camp. When I spoke to Robert Morgenthau Jr. in New York City when I was making my movie, I asked him that question. I said, why didn't Roosevelt do anything to try and save the Jews of Europe? And he looked at me and he said, as if I was an idiot, he said, we stopped Rommel. We invaded North Africa. So we have to realize that the argument um, that Ben-Gurion was having with others was not just about the War of Independence that they saw coming, but that they were actually afraid that Rommel would invade Palestine. Okay? But Rommel was defeated and North Africa was taken out of the war. In 1947, in November, the UN 
passes the partition recommendation. Big celebrations in Tel Aviv. There's a whole story about the um, manipulations of getting all of the UN votes, but they pass the partition resolution. That starts the war of independence. Independence hasn't been declared yet, but Egyptian, Iraqi, Jordanian, and Syrian forces begin to attack the pre-state Palestine. And in fact, the Haganah loses ground. Between the partition and the Declaration of Independence, the Israeli military was in a very bad position, a very bad position. Excuse me, Jer. Jerry, did you act? Did you say that fighting actually began in forty-seven, not in forty-eight? In forty-seven, right after okay. the November okay. partition. Fight, okay. Fighting started right after the November partition. Okay, didn't know that. Thank you. Then, then Israel declares independence on the day when the British mandate ends, and they don't declare independence in Jerusalem. Where do they declare independence? Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv, in a museum, an art museum that used to be Mayor Mayor Dizengoff's home. Why do they declare independence in Tel Aviv? Because it's a Jewish city, all Jewish city. No, that that that's theoretically right, but Jerusalem the reality is Jewish. they couldn't get to Jerusalem. Ah. Jerusalem was under siege. Hmm. So know. the um, Declaration of Independence is takes place in Tel Aviv and the Fascinating thing is that somebody who we are connected with through Marcy Woolman, his name is Smokey Simon, he's still alive. He just had his either 90th or 100th birthday. He took off from an airfield just north of Tel Aviv before the Declaration of Independence which was on a Friday afternoon. He was in the air when Ben-Gurion declared independence and he landed back in the state of Israel. So he took off from Palestine. <laughs> he did a reconnaissance flight. He was scoping out the Jordanian positions and then he landed back in Israel. There was celebrations right outside of Hechal Hatzmut, Independence Hall. And um, then the Egyptians' air force attacked. Tel Aviv was strafed in the first day of the new um, state. And another member of our community can tell you those stories, Suzanne Weissman, who was a young child in Tel Aviv when this happened. With the Declaration of Independence, a more formal war took place. The Israelis were initially at an incredible disadvantage, not only in terms of manpower, but in terms of equipment. And the country that supplied the equipment, with the blessing, by the way, of the USSR, was Czechoslovakia. And the equipment they supplied were actually Messerschmitts, German aircraft that had sat on the, had been captured and were sitting on the ground in Czechoslovakia, were taken apart, boxed up, shipped to Israel and put back together. So the very first planes that Israeli pilots used 
in the Air Force were Messerschmitts and other small planes. And then they got more planes in the United there. States. But the um, first heavy piece of naval equipment that they used was actually a retired Coast Guard cutter that was used as an icebreaker. And somehow it got to Israel, got mounted with weapons, and that was the Israeli Navy's first ship. And which, it was really nice when I took the Coast Guard cadets to Israel and I showed them the model of the ship and I said, you know what that is? And one guy said, that's an icebreaker. I said, exactly. And that was Israel's first ship and there's no ice in the Mediterranean. Um, the uh, war had two armistices. And in both of the armistices, both sides rearmed and rearmed and rearmed. And this is where Golda Meir came to the States instead of Ben Gurion and said, You need to help us. And she ended up raising millions and millions of dollars, um, speaking in Chicago, actually. The um, Egyptian, the Arab positions between the partition resolution and the declaration of the State of Israel were very strong. And the Israelis were at a disadvantage in terms of equipment, a severe disadvantage, and in terms of manpower. They began to address the um, disadvantage in terms of equipment, and they had secret underground bunkers where they were making Sten guns, where they were making ammunition, um, but they also got rifles from Czechoslovakia, and they also got war material coming from the United States illicitly. The, Jerry, Jerry, did the did the British do anything at all about the military incursions after the partition resolution up until independence? Did no, they block no, it in anything any way? you could argue that they were um, passively in favor of the Arab side. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Anything okay. else. They turned over their police stations to the Jordanian forces. And it, it, no, they weren't they weren't very sympathetic to the to the um, Israeli side of the of the battle. Um, I told you about Smokey Simon. He was a volunteer from South Africa, a friend of Marcy Wallman's. Marcy was also a volunteer in the Israeli Air Force. The person you might have heard of is Mickey Marcus. Mickey Marcus was an American colonel who went to Israel and he built or designed and decided that the way to relieve the siege of Jerusalem was to build what he called the Burma Road, which was a road that went along the ridges instead of in the valley. There's a valley that goes up to Jerusalem and the Arabs held the high ground on both sides, particularly on the southern side. And the Israelis needed to prove that they had access to Jerusalem in order to hold on to Jerusalem. And Mickey Marcus built this road called the Burma Road, which got um, equipment and material into Jerusalem and was able to demonstrate to the United Nations that Jerusalem was part of Israel. So when you see the old map of the old of pre-1967, you see that bulge going up to Jerusalem. That bulge is compliments of Mickey Marcus, who unfortunately died in an accidental shooting because he didn't speak Hebrew. And he had left the camp to take care of some personal business. And when he tried to come back into the camp, the guard of the camp asked him to identify himself he couldn't identify himself in Hebrew, and the guard shot him. Mm 
That's how Mickey Marcus died. So we end up with West Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is still part of Israel. And we kept Mount Scopus, where the Hadassah Hospital was, and where the Hebrew University was. But it was a very, very narrow road, and it was completely surrounded by the Jordanians. So while it was technically ours, and we kept a unit of the IDF there, it wasn't able to function. So the hospital, Hadassah Hospital, and the Hebrew University moved over. I want to talk a little bit about population, because when we um, think of population, we have to remember that for Ben-Gurion, the greatest challenge, the one he was most worried about, was the number of Jews in Palestine, which would to become Israel. And he never felt there were enough Jews. And in fact, it was an issue right up until the Soviet Union let Jews out of the Soviet Union. And I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. But I want you to understand a little bit about population. In 1517, there were 5,000 Jews in Palestine, 1517. In 1882, when the Zionist enterprise started to get going, there were 24,000 Jews in Israel. At the outbreak of World War I, there were 94,000 Jews in Israel. At the end of World War I, there were only 60,000 Jews in Israel. Jews left. World War I was a very tough time in Palestine. In 1922, there were nearly 84,000 Jews in Palestine. But in 1931, there were 174,000. In 1939, the start of the war, there were 449,000. At the end of the war, there were 543,000. And when the partition took place, there were 630,000 Jews in Israel. Now, as soon as independence was declared, all of the refugees that were stuck in Cyprus in DP camps came to Israel. They doubled the number of soldiers in the Haganah. But the little stories that you saw in the movie Exodus were true stories. They were trained with broomsticks in Cyprus. But they landed in Israel and they were thrown right into the battle. And many of them died. Many of them died. Um, I, want, I want you to understand something about death. The casualties from the War of Independence were 6,373. 4,000 soldiers and 2,400 civilians. That's the mortality, that were the deaths. The total casualties were 21,400. It was the most difficult war of all the wars they fought. Total casualties for the War of Independence, 21,400. The second highest casualty rate was the Yom Kippur War, 11,656. The Six Day War was only 5,293 total casualties. 
And in the Six Day War, there were only um, 4,517 wounded. So the total for the Six Day War was 5,293. So the War of Independence was the most costly war for Israel, and the Yom Kippur War was the second most costly war. But I want you to listen to this, and this is a point of my lecture, that the wars were not always formal wars. So during the second intifada, the second terror, wave of terror attacks on Israel, which took place from 2000 to 2008, Israel suffered 9,863 casualties. 9,863 total casualties from the Intifada. Okay. Now, um, the story of Israel is a story, as I said at the beginning, of alliances with countries. After the war, Ben-Gurion was convinced that de Gaulle would be sympathetic to the Zionist cause and he would be sympathetic to the state of Israel. And the geopolitics of it played into Ben-Gurion's hands because France was fighting a insurrection in Algeria and had a very negative attitude towards Arab nationalism. And they threw their lot in with Israel. And so did Britain. And they, those three countries, Israel, Britain, and France, invaded Egypt and captured the Suez Canal. And their goal was to guarantee shipping through the Suez Canal for Britain, France, and Israel. But guess what? Eisenhower said, nope. And everybody listened. So Israel pulled back, Britain pulled back, France pulled back, and Egypt got the Suez Canal back. But what France did do for Israel through the negotiations of Shimon Peres is build a nuclear reactor in Demona and help the Israelis manufacture atomic bombs. And this construction started in 1957 and France was an ally of Israel in just up until the Six Day War. But when it came to the Six Day War, de Gaulle said, fait pas la guerre, don't make war. And he put an embargo on Israel and the country that picked up the support militarily was the United States. But Israel won the Six Day War not with F-4s or F-15s or now F-35s. They won the Six Day War with Mirage jets, with French jets. And they built a nuclear deterrence with a nuclear reactor that France built for them. There are some other important things that happened in the 60s beside the Six Day War. One of them was the capture and trial of Eichmann. The capture of tri and trial of Eichmann was an international, an international event. And in my own home, I was um, 12 years old 
We watch the Eichmann trial every night. And most Americans watch the Eichmann trial every night. Um, in 1962, America starts to sell Israel missiles. In 1964, Israel completes the national water carrier, bringing water from the Kinneret to the northern Negev. The northern Negev turns into Israel's breadbasket. They no longer have to import all of their wheat from out of the country. And in 1966, Shai Agnon wins the Nobel Prize for Literature, writing in Hebrew. So the Six Day War happens quickly. In 1967, the um, defeat was such a stunning blow to all of the Arab nations and a shock to the world, um, such that the Palestinians, in their desperation, seem to be wanting to take over Jordan. Remember, the Palestinians had a big exodus from Palestine as a result of the War of Independence. Many of them went to Syria, many of them went to Iraq, and many, 300,000, went to Jordan. Jordan is the only country that made Palestinian refugees full citizens of Jordan. The Palestinians in Iraq were never made citizens of Iraq. The Palestinians in Syria and Lebanon were never made citizens of those countries. Jordan made them citizens. But when the Palestinian cause was decidedly defeated, Arafat seemed to try to take over the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. And he was defeated seriously and fled to Lebanon. Other things happened um, that were um, very important. In 72, the attack took place in Munich against the Israeli Olympians. That was like the Eichmann trial, something seen on TV around the world. And the tragedy of that attack was shared around the world. In 73, we had the Yom Kippur War the Yom Kippur War was the second most difficult war after the War of Independence. And um, Nixon and Kissinger managed to mobilize a shipment of materiel to Israel, which helped to turn the tide. But American Jews realized that America really didn't have the capacity to do this airlift. So they formed an organization called the Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs, JINSA. And their goal, which was much more focused than APAC, was to make sure that America would have a supply line that would work should Israel ever need it again. Okay. Now, after the Yom Kippur War, which was a very painful war, um, a group of very religious Jews decided to settle the West Bank with religious settlements. The group was called Gush Emunim, the Block of the Faithful, and they started to put settlements around the West Bank. 
I don't know if it was in response to that, but the UN in 1975 then did what was probably the worst thing it has ever done. It declared Zionism a form of racism. And they passed that resolution in 1975 and they did not rescind that resolution until 1991. And I remember wearing a, a, a pin. I am a racist. We, we had pins that we, we made. Um, after that UN resolution, the Israelis in 1976 tried to expropriate Arab lands within Israel for national ownership by the state of Israel. And the Arabs protested en masse and the police shot them. Six Israeli Arabs were killed during those protests. And that has turned into an event every March called Land Day, where the Arabs again march to remember the six Israeli Arabs that were killed. 1976 was eventful for another dramatic um, moment, and that was the rescue in Entebbe of the plane that was hijacked um, and flown to Uganda. Um, and they freed a hundred mostly Israeli and Jewish hostages that were being held by Palestinian and German gunmen. Now, I want to go backwards a bit because I want to tell you about one of the reasons that Israel was created. Israel was created to be the national homeland of the Jewish people. And on July 5th, 1950, about two years after the State of Israel was formed, they, the, the parliament, the Knesset, passed a law which is called the Right of Return Law, or the Law of Return, and it said, every Jew has the right to come to this country as an Oleh. Every Jew. And Ben-Gurion said, this law does not provide for the state to bestow the right to settle upon the Jew living abroad. It affirms that this right is inherent in him from the very fact of being a Jew. The state does not grant the right of return to the Jews of the diaspora. This right preceded the state. This right built the state. Its source is to be found in the historic and never broken connection between the Jewish people and the homeland. Now, that law of return was amended several times because it immediately brought up the question of who was a Jew. So the First Amendment was pretty much, we're going to accept essentially Hitler's definition of who is a Jew. If you have a grandparent who is a Jew, you're a Jew. Forget your parents. If you have a grandparent who is a Jew, you're a Jew. Then came the famous case of, uh, we, saw, we showed this movie in our film festival, of the Bishop of Paris wanting to go back to Israel and get Israeli citizenship. So then they passed another amendment. If you converted out of the Jewish religion, you are not a Jew. So even though the Bishop of 
Paris's parents were both Jews. He was not a Jew because he converted out of the Jewish religion. Now, I told you about um, the fatalities from the wars. It is ridiculous for us to ignore the idea that the Palestinians were not there. Even though Golda Meir loved to say, who are the Palestinians? They don't exist. But they clearly did exist. And the struggle has been between two people who both think the land is theirs. The Israelis, the Jews, who trace it back to a biblical history, and the Palestinians who lived there for 2,000 years after we were down to maybe 5,000 people living in the land. The um, Palestinians waged a war, especially after the Six Day War, that was horrific and in my opinion, destroyed their um, cause. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you a couple of things because this war is the real war. This is the war between the Palestinians and the Jews is the real war. The war between the Arab nations and Israel the Arab nations lost it twice, lost it three times. They lost it at the War of Independence, they lost it in the Six Day War, and they lost it in the Yom Kippur War. They finally got it into their head. We lost, so Egypt sued for peace, Jordan sued for peace, we have peace treaties with Egypt and Jordan, and now we have a treaty, not a treaty. We never were at war with the United Arab Emirates, but we have recognition now from another Arab country. The Israeli strategy from the very beginning was to jump over the problem you had. So when there was an Arab boycott, who did the Israelis cultivate as allies? Believe it or not, they cultivated the Turks. Turkey was a big ally of Israel. They cultivated the Iranians. The Shah of Iran was a big ally of Israel. And they cultivated all of the African nations. So they literally jumped over the surrounding Arab countries and established relations with Turkey, not an Arab nation, even though it's a Muslim nation. Iran, not an Arab nation, even though it's a Muslim nation and many, many countries in Africa, many countries in Africa. And the big construction company in Israel called Solel Bonaire just was building like crazy in Africa. Madagascar, all of the apartment buildings built by Israeli companies. You would be on safari in Africa and you would find 30 Israelis making a Passover Seder somewhere. So the Israelis had this strategy of jumping over the surrounding Arab countries and making alliances outside of those countries. It also had Germany. Germany was a key supporter of Israel. And after the debate was settled that Israel would accept reparations from Germany, Germany provided Israel with automobiles. The Arab embargo, the Arab boycott, prevented many, many countries and their car companies from supplying cars to Israel. So the cars that were on the roads in Israel were French, Renault, and German, Mercedes. And believe it or not, one Japanese company defied the, um, ja the, the boycott and sold cars to Israel. Jerry, you're nodding your head, who is it? Subaru, Subaru. So the, um, the Palestinians were screwed. And once the Israelis 
made a treaty with Egypt and a treaty with Jordan, and now a treaty with the UAE, United Arab Emirates, it's as if they're jumping again over the real problem. And the real problem is the Palestinians. That's the struggle. But the Palestinians never did anything smart, in my opinion. In 1968, they took a car bomb and blew it up in Machina Yehuda, in the market in Jerusalem. In 1970, and I'm not giving you all of them. I mean, every year there were horrible ones, but these are the worst. In 1970, they hijacked Swiss Air Flight 330. 47 people killed. The Machina Yehuda bombing, 12 people killed. In 1970, they also attacked a school bus, killed 25 people on the bus, and wounded a total of 37. Um, and that happened in northern Israel. In 1972, they attacked the airport, which is now called Ben-Gurion Airport, but it was called the Lod Airport. They attacked the airport and 106 people were wounded, 26 were killed. I already mentioned the massacre at the Munich Olympics. Another horrible one was the Ma'alot massacre, where they um, took 115 Israelis hostage and ended up killing 25. The um, 1978 attack that was horrible was the Coastal Road Massacre, where they attacked a bus on the road between Tel Aviv and Haifa. The, the um, Coastal Road Massacre um, was carried out by the, the PLO, by Fatah, in 1978. 39 people were killed. 13 of them were children. One Israeli soldier was killed, and all the attackers were killed. And 71 people were wounded. And the PLO claimed responsibility for this. And what did they want to do? They wanted to um, kill or destroy the um, Egyptian-Israeli peace talks. Now, there was another massive attack that we never hear about. And it was an attack in the headquarters of the Israeli Defense Forces in Tyre. Israel had invaded Lebanon and set up headquarters in Tyre. On November 11th, 1982, um, there was an attack by a Peugeot car packed with explosives and 75 Israeli soldiers were killed. Soldiers, Shin Bet, border policemen. And they did it again in 1983, also in Tyre. So when Israel withdrew from Lebanon, it was seen as a victory for these terrorists and these terror attacks. And it was a victory for them. In 1977, I'm running out of time here, we get the uh, Camp David Accords. Walter Cronkite talking to Sadat and to Begin and making a blind date between the two of them. And then Sadat coming to Jerusalem, extremely dramatic, extremely important, followed up by the invasion of Lebanon. And then um, 
1987, the first intifada. Hamas is formed in 1987. Hamas is a religious fundamentalist organization, the PLO and Fatah, secular nationalist. 1991, we have the Gulf War, Scuds being fired at Israel, 39 of them. The Americans begging the Israelis not to retaliate. The Israelis do not retaliate. To support that Israeli decision, in October, the US and the USSR sponsor a peace conference in Madrid. This is the first time that the leaders of Israel, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and, and Palestinians sit down to talk. The first time. And Yitzhak Shamir showed up and he lost the election right after he showed up. The Labor Party, which had been out of power since 77, returns in 92 with Rabin as prime minister, and they reached the Oslo Accords in 1995, in 1993. In 95, um, uh, Rabin and Arafat signed an agreement to transfer more power to the Palestinian National Authority and um, a lot of intense negotiation takes place and a roadmap for peace eventually comes out in 2003. But in 1995, a key thing happens. Rabin is assassinated. I don't know how many of you watched the funeral for Rabin, but Arab leaders came to the funeral for Rabin. The whole world came to the funeral for Rabin. Eventually, Ariel Sharon becomes prime minister and pulls out of Gaza. He then, he pulls out of Gaza in 2005. In 2006, he has a stroke. He has a stroke in 2006. And the Gaza withdrawal did not lead to peace. In fact, it led to more war. In 2008, after there was a conference saying we're going to have a two-state solution at Annapolis in the United States, Israel invades Gaza. A massive month-long invasion intending to prevent Hamas from launching rockets into Israel. It failed. In I'm really running out of time. In 2015, Netanyahu forms his first, his fourth government. You have and, one more minute. Right. I'm Form, sorry to interrupt. I got it. Forms his fourth government, and it's a government without any religious parties. So in some ways, it was a popular government. Um, in 2015, um, the EU says, label all products from the West Bank as not made in Israel, made in the West Bank. In 2016, under Obama, Israel gets the biggest military assistance package in the history of Israel and in the history of the United States. It gets... 3.8 billion dollars a year over 10 years. 
up from 3.1 billion. And then we get Trump. He recognizes Jerusalem, step one, and moves the embassy there. He recognizes Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights. He theoretically floats an endorsement of annexing parts of the West Bank, but then he brokers a deal with the United Arab Emirates and Netanyahu gives up annexation in exchange for the deal with the United Arab Emirates. And now the big question is, where will the ambassador from the United Arab Emirates set up an office, in Tel Aviv or in Jerusalem? And that's the big question. We'll wait to see. Thank you very much for Thank listening. Thank you very much. Weeks. And uh, it was most enjoyable. I appreciated it very much that you all came. Thank you, Jerry. Thank, Thank you. you, Jerry. Thank Thank you Jerry. Okay. Go pray. I'm going to go have dinner. Bye. Pray hard. Jerry, the next big question is the F 35s. Yes, it is. Although it sounds like it's really right? not a question. That's a done deal. Yeah, I, I don't think it's a question. That was that you was think the it's bribe. Go through? That was yeah, the bribe. That was, I mean, that was, was the bribe. The Trump said to UAE, "I'll sell you F-35s if you recognize Israel." Right. That was part of the deal. I think that's so. that's crazy to sell F-35s in that neck of the woods. Yes, it is. Crazy. But you realize that they're both aiming at Iran, both Israel and the United Arab Emirates. Israel is now in bed with the Sunni Arabs. And they're aiming I understand. At I understand. But if somebody takes over the UAE, who might get those F-35s? Lila Tove. Lila Tove. To All right, you. I got to go. Thank, Thank you, Jerry.